Well, hello there. It's Bruce Williams again, and today I want to present the sixth lecture in my series on ultrastructural pathology and description. And we're going to start on the infectious agents. A good place to start will be the viruses. A couple basic notes on viruses. One, to me, they pretty much all look alike. They're little hexagonal things. They often stain darkly. And there's not a lot of clues as to how you can tell one from another. I don't remember the size, so the scales at the, at the bottom of the ultrastructural micrograph doesn't really help me. So I'm going to give you a couple clues that I've used over the years to try to tell them apart. I think some of the keys are the location of the virus within the cell. As a general rule, the DNA viruses, because they replicate using single or double-stranded DNA, will be found developing in the nucleus. The RNA viruses generally develop in the cytoplasm. Now, another thing about viruses is that some proliferate in regular arrays known as crystalline or paracrystalline arrays. The other ones just sort of replicate willy-nilly. There are only a few of them, and we'll look at some of them, that have unique shapes that will help you quickly identify what type of virus it is. So with that, let's look at a picture of some of these viruses that we will see. <coughs> the DNA viruses, the largest of all DNA viruses is pox virus. Um, it has a particular dumbbell-shaped nucleoid and nothing else really looks like it. It's a big virus. And the third thing that this particular virus does that will help you is it often forms a large inclusion in the cytoplasm. Now, generally when we talk about inclusions, we talk about cytoplasmic inclusions and nuclear inclusions. And those may be made up of virus particles, often in various crystalline array, which makes them large enough to see under the microscope. Or it could be a mess of viral proteins, usually found in the cytoplasm. They're not virus particles, per se, but it's big enough. These are, these are just proteins that when the virus hi hijacks the machinery of the cell are created in large numbers. So they can be big enough that we can see them under the microscope. But when you look at them on ultrastructural micrograph, don't be fooled. Don't say, oh, there's no virus particles there. That's not the inclusion I see. It very often is. So just remember, inclusions can be made of virus particles or not. They're still big enough for you to see under the microscope. Okay, so you have the, uh, the pox viruses. The Aspar virus is basically uh, African swine fever. It's another large virus, used to be an iridovirus. One of the ones that's fairly characteristic is herpes virus because of its targetoid uh, appearance and the fact that you usually see it in the nucleus. Adenoviruses like to pop up in, uh, in crystalline array. Then we start getting into some of the very small ones, like the parvoviruses and the circoviruses, um, and those can be very tricky. Um, some of the ones that have very interesting shapes are the filoviruses, which often look like rods or crooks, and the rhabdoviruses, which look like bullets. Uh, another one that is somewhat identifiable is the coronavirus, which whose capsid is studded with many peplomeres or projections from the surface. Unfortunately, those don't show up in transmission electron micrography. They only show up in if you're looking at suspension of feces or something like that uh, in a fluid suspension. So let's look at a couple of these, and I think this is. Uh, fairly prototypical f in demonstrating my problem with viruses. Okay, this is tissue from a horse. Uh, actually, this is from a mouse. The, the disease is equine encephalitis. These are toga viruses, and, and to me, they're, they're pretty typical. Uh, they are small, they are hexagonal, um, and they can look like a lot of other things. So it's very difficult to identify one particular viral particle. We can only see them when they are proliferating. Um, these particular toga viruses um, from a disease known as equine, 
eastern encephalitis, some people call them alpha viruses, um, are actually proliferating <coughs> in either the endoplasmic reticulum or lysosomes. They are phagocytized uh, by neurons through coated bits, and they trans, they are generally uh, brought into the cell within phagosomes. But they have the ability to prevent the fusion of the phagosome with the lysosome and modify the phagosomes, or if they get into the ER, they can modify that to become little viral factories and places in which the virus particles are made, and then they will bud off into from the, from the uh, organelle cell membrane. It's tough to say what to call these now. I'm just going to call it endoplasmic reticulum, but it's something in between that. Um, and they will bud off. You can see them free in the cytoplasm, and then when this neuron ruptures, it will release all of the viruses into the cellular space. Because it is proliferating in the cytoplasm, my assumption is this is an RNA virus. <coughs> Here's another RNA virus which is a picornavirus, uh, meaning very small. And luckily for us, picornavirus is an RNA virus, because out here it is out in the cytoplasm. They proliferate in pericrystalline arrays. Otherwise, we probably never would have discovered this particular virus back in the 50s and 60s when they were one of the first viruses to be discovered. This particular patch of virus is in an endothelial cell of a baboon infected with encephalomyocarditis, a disease that in most animal species, with the exception of rodents, affects the cardiovascular system. Rodents are the, the one species that develop uh, brain lesions as well, and they're also the host for that particular one. This is, it's a interesting picture. If you look very closely, you can see the pericrystalline array. I have some other viruses, most of our viruses that, that proliferate in per pericrystalline arrays are DNA viruses, and I have some other pictures later on that will show you that a little closer. Here's a negative stain of coronavirus from the feces of a ferret. <coughs> and everybody's uh, very excited about coronaviruses right now, and, and we should be. Coronaviruses are one of the most infectious viruses. My experience working with this particular agent was that it was extremely infectious, and even with rigorous control in the laboratory animal rooms, we had accidental uh, infections. Uh, you know, we had a protocol where you'd have to walk from the clean rooms into the dirty rooms and never backwards. Uh, I had one technician that accidentally walked from a dirty room into a clean room, spun on a seal, walked right out, and then within two days, every animal in, the, uh, in that room was infected. It, these are some of the most contagious viruses uh, in animal species, TGE, porcine uh, epidemic, diarrhea. Most species have their own coronavirus, bovine coronavirus, canine coronavirus, and of course, the many coronaviruses that humans have, some of which we've gotten from other animal species. Um, but before I give you a lecture on coronavirus, and that's not the purpose of this lecture, it's how to identify. And this is a suspension of feces. It's a negative stain. So you're viewing sort of the outline of these viruses. And this is where you can see the peplomeres, which stud the outer capsid of this particular virus. Uh, note that uh, not all coronaviruses um, are perfectly round. They can be sort of oblong shaped, they can be indented, they, they can have a sort of variety of shape. And then when we look at them on, the, uh, on EM, these are replicating within lysosomes and ER, just like we saw with the toga viruses. Um, you can't see the peplomeres. So it's nice to know that that's something that you're not going to see in most of your preparations. This, I believe, was infected, infection in a turkey <coughs> Excuse me, for many years ago. So uh, they're definitely viral particles. Uh, if you know that they're replicating in phagosomes and, and lysosomes, you can say with confidence that it's an RNA virus. But like I've said so many times before, 
ultrastructural pathology is not something that you want to do blinded. You need to have some information about the species you're looking at, sometimes about the organ system that you're looking at, and a history of the particular disease before you go and make specific diagnoses. One of the great benefits in, in working today is that now so many of the viral diseases are diagnosed by genomics and PCR well before they're taken to ultrastructure, and ultrastructure is often done as an afterthought for many papers that are published so people can visualize the virus. And <clears throat> the one thing that I don't think that you can replace ultrastructure in terms of, of viral disease is delineating the pathogenesis of a particular disease. It does have a very important place there to show how the disease attacks the body and its cells in various stages. Well, here is one of those uh, uh, viruses that you probably won't confuse with other viruses because it has this sort of bullet shape appearance with one flat end and one curved end. And this is very characteristic of the rhabdovirus. This is a negative stain of a rhabdovirus, uh, which was from a rabid skunk. Rabies is probably the most famous rhabdoviruses. There are a couple of other rhabdoviruses of note. Vesicular stomatitis um, is a rhabdovirus. So this is your uh, uh, negative stain. And luckily for us, none of these uh, uh, viruses tend to cross-react on serology. And this is actually a picture from the mandibular gland of the salivary or glands of the skunk. And you can see quite a variety of things going on. You can see inclusions w in which are developing the viral particles. And then in between, they're surrounded by a lot of microfilament protein aggregates. <coughs> and this is probably what would look like a Negri body on uh, if you looked at this under glass, and it's a combination, uh, mostly viral protein and developing viral particles. So rhabdoviruses, not too difficult. Uh, and if you were looking at a horse with uh, ulcers on its lips, inside its mouth, on its coronary bands, then obviously you would be thinking about vesicular stomatitis rather than rabies. So there's a lot of important information you need to have before you get to that. Just one more picture of the rhabdoviruses, and they often have this little line or scoring within them. We don't, so we can just barely see it on this picture. If you need a little bit more information, then that's sort of a cool thing. Well, this is something, if you ever see it, will really ruin your day, unless you're a researcher working at, at places like. Uh, uh, the U.S. Army Institute of Infectious Diseases, the CDC, because this is the characteristic picture of a filovirus. The various hemorrhagic fevers are, are filoviruses, and then um, some very nasty agents. The Ebola virus and Marburg virus are both filoviruses. They do tremendous amount of destruction. Um, they proliferate in large numbers. And they also will result in the formation of large intracytoplasmic inclusions, which are composed of excess viral protein. So filoviruses, I don't think, are, are too difficult to identify. Retroviruses are very interesting. Um, so many of the early papers of retrovirus were identified solely on the presence of retroviral-like particles, and that makes me a little bit nervous, especially nowadays we can go back and we can run genomics on a lot of this. And the early literature in the 60s and 70s and so many species are, are is rife with uh, papers that said that various diseases were, were 
caused by retroviruses when simply they saw a lot of round things. And, and I'm a, a, an ultrastructural pathologist who really hates to be too specific and be, uh, be too determined to find infectious agents. Retroviruses are generally round. Um, they tend to have dense nucleoids. Uh, one of the most common retroviruses, or at least uh, in the research literature, is are the lentiviruses, which have a dense, somewhat triangular nucleoid. And these are in the extracellular space uh, from the uh, a nasal tumor in a goat. This was a type B retrovirus that causes uh, or ENTB, enzootic nasal tumors of goats, a well-known contagious neoplasm. Uh, there are uh, several viruses that will cause nasal tumors. Uh, nasal tumor ENTA causes nasal tumor in sheep. ENTB causes nasal tumor in goats. Um, these, are, these are viruses that have not previously been seen in the British Island, but if you're reading the literature, recently there was a paper uh, of a go which developed a nasal tumor and in Ireland, I believe, and it turned out that that was due to a related virus, the Yagsikti virus, which usually causes pulmonary tumors. So a very interesting in the area of potential communication of tumors. Okay, another RNA virus that you will see, and remember I always like to throw in some slides with some degenerative changes, so let's start with that. We are where? Okay, if you've watched the previous lectures, you will know that we are looking at cross sections of three or four epithelial cells. They have a microvillar border, which is all about the same size. So it's like somebody mowed the lawn. So we know when we see that we are looking uh, at the intestine. And I'll tell you, this is the intestine of a pig. And these four cells show some significant, at least the ones in the middle, show some significant degenerative changes. Uh, we can start with the loss of surface substructures. We see that in regenerative change when the cell, uh, the cytoskeleton of the cell breaks down because it's lost the capacity to produce enough energy and it takes energy to maintain the cytoskeletal integrity. So all of these microvilli just bloop, and they go away. Um, so we see loss of, of microvilli. The cytosol is considerably more lucent and we have dilated profiles of endoplasmic reticulum suggesting that there is water that is seeping or fluid that is seeping into the cell and the cell is actually compressing the adjacent cell. The tight junctions still seem to be holding out, but if you look down here in between these cells, they seem to have pulled apart or maybe that's a very, this might be your, your, your junction here, that might just be a huge cavity within the cell. I think that's probably what's going on there. And then we can look at this nucleus. Notice this is the only nucleus that we can see. Everything else is down below this part of the picture. So I would submit that this nucleus is now floating free because of the damage to the cytoskeleton. And, and I don't like to use the term large or swollen. It's sort of difficult to do when you have an N of one, but, but that might be a pretty good thought. And you can see that the chromatin, for the most part, is just lysed and is replaced by cells in paracrystalline array. Now, if you also look, you have cells in, I mean, sorry, so you have virus particles in the endoplasmic reticulum. And I've already told you that you can't have virus particles in the nucleus and the uh, developing in the nucleus and developing in the cytoplasm. Well, I might not have told you, but I'm telling you now. That should be a big disconnect. We have the DNA viruses that replicate in the nucleus. We have the RNA viruses that replicate in the cytoplasm. And never the twain shall meet. And that's true. 
you can have DNA viruses which are replicating in the nucleus. This would give us a, a nuclear inclusion and you could have a big viral protein inclusion with no particles in the cytoplasm and that happens very commonly. But uh, you can't have them in both. So this is a great picture because not only does it show the degeneration of cells associated with the viral infection, but also what happens when on rare occasions you have multiple viral infections. Okay, these viral particles in the endoplasmic reticulum from a pig are rotavirus particles. And, and uh, if you had told me that these are coronavirus particles, because the coronavirus particles, if we pop back, can be dark like that, I couldn't argue with you on that. Remember, you can't often tell them apart. They're about the same size. Those two diseases, interestingly, show a lot of the same characteristics, both extremely contagious, both affect villar epithelium, both look very similar on, uh, uh, on EM. And when you look at it under glass, you will see vacuolar degeneration, which is probably what's going on down here with these large cavities in the cell. So this is rotavirus in a pig. This happened to be a concurrent infection with adenovirus, which we'll talk about a little bit. I mentioned earlier that they like to uh, appear in crystalline or paracrystalline array. I don't really know the difference between those two terms, so I use them probably interchangeably and probably incorrectly. The other thing that that is a characteristic, at least to me, about adenovirus is when it's in the nucleus, it just lays waste to the chromatin. And so many of the adenovirus cases, you know, it does not play nicely with chromatin. It does a lot of damage. So this is a tricky one. I do throw some complicated ones in every once in a while, and we try to work our way through them. So double viral infection, serious degeneration, you might even want to call it vacuolar degeneration in one cell in these uh, uh, particular, in this particular photomicrograph. And I can tell you that this many, many years ago, 30 years or more, was on the, uh, was on a certification examination. Okay, this is a tough another tough slide um, because of the cellularity of this particular part of the body. We take, if we take a look, this, here are our friends. These are erythrocytes. Okay, here's more erythrocytes. So we have a capillary here. We have a lot of white space here, which suggests that we are either in the kidney or the lung. And then we have a cell here, which is protruding into the lumen, it is quite degenerate, and the nucleus contains viruses and paracrystalline array. The cells, which we will presume are pneumocytes, are largely, this one is totally degenerate, and I'll wait in necrosis, look how black it's gotten. This particular one, is still hanging on, the nucleus doesn't look too bad, but we have significant vaculation and degeneration um, within, and I would submit that those are proliferation of the, uh, uh, not proliferation, but dilation of smooth endoplasmic reticulum. We have this cell that's just sort of hanging off with a nucleus with very degenerate uh, chromatin and paracrystal arrays, and this is another adenovirus, this is canine adenovirus. Now if you're going to ask me what are all these other cells, these are cells that are within the uh, alveolar septa. Some may be macrophages, it could be septal macrophages. We may have two septa that are stuck together that are atelectatic. Um, it can be when you look at the alveolar septa just out of the blue in very inflamed lung it can be very confusing if you have a series of images that show progressive change then that's a little easier to get your head around but uh, this was a uh, an a old Wednesday slide conference from from many years back
Well, I'm familiar with this particular entity, but I think I've given you sort of a, uh, uh, a preview of this. Okay, we're looking at one cell. I know where this was taken. Uh, I was present when the picture was taken, and this was from the liver of a chimpanzee. And we've mentioned this before. This is a hepatocyte. And I'm looking at it, and whenever I look at, at a section of liver, I always look to see if maybe I can find a biocanaliculus so I can prove my point. But if there's one here, absolutely can't, can't pick it out. We're probably looking at several hepatocytes, maybe one here, one here, one here. Not sure what this particular nucleus belongs to. The inset shows just the higher magnification of these viruses in crystalline array. They're your very typical hexagonal virus, nothing exciting, but what really uh, is great about this picture is it shows that very characteristic destruction and lysis of the nucleus. This, this state cell is at an end stage. The nuclear lemma is totally gone. The viruses are starting to float free in the cytoplasm and then obviously when this cell ruptures everything is going to go out and infect other cells. But I just love this for the very characteristic destruction that you can see with adenovirus in the nucleus of infected cells. more virus particles in paracrystalline array, and there's no way you're going to get to what this is, but this is canine distemper virus. And more biliviruses tend to cause, as we know, a combination of intranuclear inclusions and intracytoplasmic inclusions. The intranuclear inclusions are caused by the proliferation of the virus within the nucleus. It is a DNA virus, and then those large, much more uh, obvious cytoplasmic inclusions are caused by accumulations of viral proteins. This is distemper from a dog. Um, we are in, I'm going to give you a second to try and figure out where we are. Okay, as you searched around, Hopefully you saw that you know we have some cells that are obviously in various stages of degeneration here. We have one cell here which is bulging against the other ones. We have dilation of the endoplasmic reticulum. You can see that the nuclear membrane is dilated. But the key to tell where you are, hopefully you start looking at the top and there are all these dense bodies. These are the basal bodies. Most of the cilia in this particular uh, cell have been shed, but you can see some in the cell next door, okay, that are hanging on. So you see the basal bodies, here are your tight junctions, that one's hanging on, that one is hanging on. Remember that all cells have cilia and microvilli, it's not one or the other. The cilia are gone here and so are the microvilli. So we have evidence of advanced degeneration, possibly not reversible. I would tend to imagine it is. And then this nucleus has that virus again in the crystalline or paracrystalline arrays, but also the cells next door to it and that cell have large, dense viral inclusions of viral protein. You won't find any virus in here. It's a DNA virus but you will see these inclusions. So now we've seen a nice picture of the virus in the nucleus, and we've seen a pretty nice picture of the inclusions that it makes mixed in with some degenerative changes. Hopefully you're starting to get a little bit of more confidence at this point, and you realize, you know, I can do this. I may not be able to take a picture like this and just immediately jump down on a diagnosis, and honestly, I don't think I could either. But I think if you have a nice picture of distemper in the airway or the lung of a dog, and you, you'll be able to compare the two and start noticing, oh, that's what this looks like on ultrastructure. That makes perfect sense to me. I like going through these because uh, 
you know, I haven't seen these in a while, so it, it's like seeing old friends. Um, this is also distemper. Um, we don't have a, a good pericrystalline array. We have a couple of aggregates here. You can see the virus particles are in the nucleus. As long as this nuclear membrane is intact, they're going to stay in the nucleus. Now, there will be times, as we saw in that chimp liver, where if that nuclear membrane is ruptured, there's nothing to keep the viruses from going out into the cytoplasm and finding a couple there. But if the nuclear membrane is intact, it's a pretty good barrier. Um, these, these particular viruses we looked at don't bud out through the nuclear membrane. But we're going to see one in a minute that does and, and is very characteristic in that. We are still with distemper because um, I guess I just had a lot of old pictures of that and here is a close-up of that viral protein inclusion and there's no virus particles here it's just a bunch of filaments of protein and will this be used to make the virus not when the virus hijacks the machinery of the cell it certainly makes all the proteins necessary but it makes some other proteins too so a lot of times no those will not be used Okay. Nucleus, cytoplasm, virus particles here with a very targetoid appearance. Okay, looks like a little bullseye. A little bullseye in the nucleus. Now here's one that is going through the nuclear membrane. I said we would have a couple of these, and, and this is herpes virus. Herpes virus is a DNA virus, and it acquires several layers of membrane around its capsid by budding through the nuclear membrane where it's been formed, and then through the cell membrane. And then that it can become infectious, and the early production of virus particles does not result in cellular lysis. Later on when you have lots and lots and lots of that stuff going on, the cell will lyse. But you can have a number of virus particles leave the cell without the cell rupturing. So uh, it's a process of maturing, acquiring their envelope, and then it will move out into the intracellular space to infect another cell. But one of the really nice characteristics about herpes virus is is there's a bunch of little targets within the nucleus. And if you're lucky, you can see them budding into the nuclear space and then out of it again. Just a, a close-up nucleus, budding par particle, acquiring the envelope, moving, going to move into another cell. This is uh, herpes virus from a given. I've had this picture for a long time. Um, this is a cultured human T lymphocyte virus with uh, this being infected by the lentivirus that causes uh, HIV. And you can see just the incredible amounts of virus particles adhering to the receptors on this cell. It'll take just a minute and I want you to tell me where we are before we discuss lentiviruses just a little more. Wow what a crazy busy slide but if you go back to one of our lectures we talked about nerves, myelinated and unmyelinated nerves. And here's a combination of, of myelinated nerves here, none of which look very good. You know, this might be the best looking myelinated nerve here. This is probably the nucleus of a oligodendroglia, which is investing membrane around all of these nerves, but it's likely ill and so the myelin is starting to fall apart and if you look within this particular photomicrograph you have to look very carefully you will see virus particles and i don't know whether we are in the uh, brain or and, and we're likely in the brain 
um, because there was a spate of images and spate, sorry, a spate of articles back in the late 80s um, about simian uh, immunodeficiency virus, a lentivirus that was the animal model for HIV. And Dr. Gary Baskin and the folks down Tulane, every month in VetPath or every other month in VetPath, you would have another article describing the changes in the respiratory tract, the changes in the GI tract, the changes in the skin, the changes in the in the nervous system. And this is from that particular article. But one of the nice things is he took this picture and blew it up. And lentiviruses have a particular conic conical uh, core to them. Um, but remember, you have to get them just right. Okay, because if you cut them transversely like this, you're just going to get something that looks round. But when you have a lot of them, you will see that a number of them have this sort of pyramidal or, or conical core, which will help you identify them as lentiviruses. Okay, you're going to, once I describe this slide, you're going to say, aha, so that's what it looks like. Okay, this is a coilocyte. This is a, this is a, a cell in the skin of a dog. This is from viral, a viral papilloma that has been infected by canine papillomavirus. And when we look for coelocytes, we look for cells with two different things. We look for one, cells that are swollen, they have a very glassy sort of amphiphilic appearance. And then the other thing, if they're true coelocytes, will have an intranuclear inclusion. And that intranuclear inclusion are these very small viruses, which luckily for us um, will form crystalline arrays and be large enough that we can see that inclusion. I think a lot of... Uh, a lot of residents just want to jump on anything that looks big and glassy and say that's a coelocyte. But if you're really looking for the true coelocyte, that's the one that has an intranuclear inclusion as well. And then what makes that glassy, swollen appearance? What makes it? These are just tremendous proliferation of keratin filaments within the cytoplasm. It's part of the cytopathic effect of this papillomavirus. So we have two things going on here. We have this keratin proliferation uh, of intermediate filaments. It never truly keratinizes or lamellates or does whatever it needs to, like we see in, the, uh, in, the, in, in keratinizing squamous epithelium. Just sort of forms this big puffy cloud of filaments and the intranuclear inclusion. Okay. And then here is the granddaddy or the grandmama of all viruses. They're actually bigger viruses. Um, there, are, there are bigger viruses than this, but really for our particular, uh, uh, for domestic species, um, this is the biggest one. Uh, and as we said before, it generally has a dumbbell-shaped core. This is an odd picture. I know it was shot many, many years ago at the AFIP. I'm not exactly sure how they got this. This appears to be a cytoplasmic invagination in the middle of the nucleus. The nucleus looks, you know, very bizarre to me. But it shows you the number of, of virus particles in the cytoplasm of an infected cell. Now, this is a DNA virus, and I like to say that these darn things are so big that they can't fit in the nucleus. Uh, I don't know the accuracy of that, but most of the ones I see are in the cytoplasm, and they're usually fully formed. And then the other thing that you will see with pox viral infections is you will see a large inclusion. Um, and that's very common in birds. We call them Bollinger bodies. Um, and, and you often see them in most types of pox, whether it's sheep pox or seal pox or whatever. And once again, we're looking at viral protein rather than virus particles as well. I think that the pox uh, viral infections are a really straightforward ultrastructural diagnosis because nothing has this, nothing is this big and has these sort of dumbbell shaped. Let's just show a couple of other interesting 
um, but, but very difficult to diagnose. Virus particles, paramyxoviruses, with the exception of the morbilli viruses, can be very difficult to, they tend to interestingly often bud out along cilia or microvilli. They don't cause a cell to rupture, but they like to, they like to bud out. They're sort of very amorphic looking particles, bulbous or long or something like that. And that's one of those that, you know, I rarely get to see and I don't have a good grasp on. So um, this is a fun one. Um, this is iridovirus. Uh, this is a ranovirus here, and you can see the particles. Iridoviruses are, are uh, primarily uh, viruses of amphibians and perhaps insects. We don't see them, but they're just fun to look at. One of the other things that often happens is people miss, try and misinterpret things as virus, especially if you're looking for a virus. And I've seen a lot of people go into the to EM lab saying, I'm going to go find a virus. Okay. And they come back with all sorts of, of other things. Um, and we've, we've talked about this before. Here are true viruses. Here are true viruses. These are coronaviruses. And I, I forget where this picture came from. But then you have these structures out here which are likely to be stain artifact, but you can see the stain artifact can look very much like a virus. This is within a structure. This is where you expect, this is in the middle of a cell. And so I would be very careful with that. We've seen these structures before. They're round, they contain small spherules within them. These are multivesicular bodies. These are areas of, these are, are phagosomes or phagolysosomes which contain little globules of worn out uh, cell or organelle membrane. They're very common in the cell. So people look at that and they say, oh, I've got some viruses. If you get a nice, very serendipitous cut of the nuclear membrane, you may see nuclear pores and, and uh, uh, interpret those as viruses in pericrystalline array. You know you're in the area of the nucleus, but they just, they don't have the definition that you would expect with viruses. And then there you will always find aggregates of little linear schmoo in cells. And I use that term lightly, but uh, um, I can't tell you how many hours I've spent looking at schmoo and trying to make something out of it. And I've come away after many years of doing this by just saying, don't force anything. If it's a virus, you'll find it, it'll jump out at you don't try to interpret something as a virus. It's easier to refute that some, or it's more important to refute something as a virus. If you can prove it, it isn't, that's more important than trying to make something into a virus. Okay, we're at 45 minutes. I'm gonna go ahead and do bacteria. We'll finish this lecture probably a little over an hour because bacteria are, are, are sort of dull. Um, not the viruses are all that exciting, but in terms of ultra structure, you can't tell much of anything about bacteria. And we've seen some before. Uh, if you can cut them tangentially, you can cut them, you know, like this. Sometimes you'll find where they are reproducing. They have no real internal structure. They stain light or dark. They can be variegated on the inside and you can make out a cell wall. Now the cell wall of gram negative agents tend to be thinner than gram positive agents. They stain a little less densely. Um, and any cell may have surface appendages, which you can see like fimbria, fragella, or something like that, but there's really not much going on in here. And there never is, with the exception of the spore forming bacteria, then you can see a spore, but this is about all you get with a bacterium. Here is Streptococcus from a white-tailed deer, and 
you can see that there are these infoldings of the plasma membrane. And I probably should mention them because it turns out they're nothing. But for many years, people said, oh, they got mesosomes. They called these mesosomes. And they said, well, those are the province of, of a gram positive agent. And it turns out that they're an artifact of preparation in these. So um, it's nice that it's in a chain like, a, like strep should be. But it's really difficult to, you know, at this magnification to tell where am I? What am I looking at besides the fact that I'm looking at round coccoid bacteria or cocci? Uh, look at this inclusion right here. And we've been talking about this. I don't know what this is. It is just sort of a lot of protein in here. Does that mean that we have a concurrent viral infection in the same same slide? I don't think so. But so this is a nice picture of strep. I think that you do much better diagnosing bacteria from a little farther back. Okay, rather than just run up on something, which is not going to help whether it's a viral agent or bacteria. Stay back. See what tissue you're in and how it interacts because a lot of bacteria have a very characteristic interaction with the tissue rather than being characteristic in how they look. We're looking at the ileum of a rabbit. And I think you'll be able to pick out that there are surface associated bacteria here and they're about as exciting as nothing because all they are are black with some vacuoles. I mean, you can't tell much about but they are attached to the surface of this enterocyte. The enterocyte itself isn't looking all that good because we have dilation of smooth endoplasmic reticulum. We have loss and remodeling of the sur cellular surface. The, the cell next to it is starting to get dark. We have changes in the nucleus here, which look like crescent formations. There may be apoptosis going on. Um, and if this is how long the microvilli should be, these are very stunted. So we have loss of, of the surface substructures as a result of uh, assembly of the cytoskeleton. But let's go back and look at these particular bacteria and how they are interacting with the cells. Some are sitting up on little pedestals. Some are in divots or cups within the cytoplasm. Pedestal, cup. There's yeah, something in between. Okay, this one that has a nice pedestal, so does that one. And these are in cups here. And that's what their term, the term for attaching a facing E. coli in the rabbit, and pretty much all of theirs is attaching a facing. They have the traditional cup and pedestal attachment sites on enterocytes. So it's not what the bacterium looks like for the most part. It's how it interacts with the cell that will help get you to a diagnosis. This is also E. coli. Okay, where are we? Well, we're somewhere in the GI tract. A, because it's E. coli, although there are extra intestinal forms of E. coli, which can really do some damage in the lungs of a dog. But look how nicely these microvilli are arrayed. They're just, someone mowed the lawn. So, and they're not that long, so maybe we're in the ileum or something like that. I, I don't want to make that judgment here, but they're all the same. So I know we're in the intestine. We have bacteria. We have tremendous numbers of fimbria around them, which show up nicely. And note that there is no attachment to this cell. The microvilli are in great shape. These are, are attached by fimbria, but they're sitting off of the cell, so they're not damaging the cell. But this animal has severe diarrhea because these are en enterotoxigenic forms of E. coli. Could I look at that and say that that's E. coli? Heck no. But I have to know a little bit about the clinical disease and the species, and that will help me. Okay, love this picture. Okay, where are we? 
We're in the respiratory system, right? Because there are all these cilia. No, we are not. Okay, here's a mucus cell. We're actually in the colon of a rhesus monkey. Could be a pig, could be a guinea pig, but it's a rhesus monkey. This is a GABA cell from the colon. There's not a single cilium in here. All of these are bacilli. These are long bacilli. These are treponemes, which are sitting on end, filling up every bit of available real estate. And this is very characteristic for brachyspirapilosicoli. The disease is called colonic spiroketosis. Uh, of the three important brachyspira, brachyspirapilosicoli, and then brachyspirahyodysenterii and amsini in pigs, this is the one that, even though there are so many more organisms, doesn't really cause that much damage. Not a lot of damage, diarrhea, yes, but not a lot of damage. Whereas the other two just absolutely lay waste to the mucosa in a disease known as uh, swine dysentery. I've always found that interesting that you could have that many, that many bacteria on end and not devastate the mucosa or the function of the colon. But that's a fun one too. I think I could get to that from this picture. Okay, I've mentioned it before, I know that my residents hear this a lot and they get really tired of it, but there are a number of bacteria that want nothing more out of life than to be a cilium. And I don't know what's so great about being a cilium, but that's their dream and who am I to interfere with that? And these are, uh, these are agents that we very characteristically see in areas of the body that have cilia, including the respiratory tract, lots of cilia, the middle and inner ear, the reproductive tract, we've seen that. They do not do very well in the, uh, uh, in the parts of the brain that have cilia. I don't think they're attracted to that. But the ones that you want to think about, um, these agents that want nothing more than to be cilia, are Bordetella, Mycoplasma, and an agent which used to be called Carbacillus, which stands for Cilia Associated Respiratory Bacillus. And now it's been renamed um, as Philobacter rodentium. I think about that for a minute. Um, it isn't totally restricted to rodents, but generally it's a disease of rodents and rabbits. It has been identified in the very rare dog, and I think a calf and maybe a pig, but it's mostly a rodent bacteria. We're looking at the trachea of a turkey and we have a cross-section of multiple uh, epithelial cells, some of which have obviously lucent cytoplasm. They tend to be bulging out. Okay, this one's sort of dark so it might be degenerate. There's dilated smooth endoplasmic reticulum. It seems to be shrinking and turning dark. And in these, or at least along the surface of these two particular cells in the center, you can see large numbers of bacteria which are mixed in with the cilia. Cilia are going straight, the bacteria are thicker, they are darker. Um, you can see the microvilli, because every epithelial cell that has cilia also has microvilli. They're down here. The bacteria don't really care about them. This is Bordetella avium. Um, you can see Bordetella in a rare or a large number of species. Um, it is a common cause of morbidity and not uncommon mortality in certain species, such as uh, guinea pigs. It's one of the number one infectious diseases. And it's one that I always say don't sleep on because Bordetella has some very significant toxins, not only the, the gram-negative endotoxin because it's gram-negative, but also some uh, leukocytotoxins, which can cause a disease that for all intents and purposes in an infected animal, it looks like a bad case of shipping fever in an ox. So don't sleep on Bordetella. Um, there was an article published probably about four or five years ago, I think in JVDI, that uh, um, looked at a number of cases of Bordetella at very high magnification with a gram stain 
and you can actually see if you have a case that some areas are not just totally destroyed you can see the bacteria in and among the cilia you have to use oil and you have to have a very good non-dirty gram stain but uh, it's nice and I've done that a couple of times since then and it does tend to work but looking uh, in and among cilia one of the ones you want to think about is bordetella this is why we also see bordetella infections in the reproductive tract in guinea pigs and and you can see see it there here is uh, an older picture from the 80s of Filobacter rodentium when it was brand new on the scene and it was called Carbacillus and this was from a mouse and here it is trying to be very inconspicuous among all of these cilia remember that cilia have these stripes which run the length of them and bacteria don't and then finally this is in the inner ear of a pig uh, in the cilia and then among the cilia deep near the microvilli you see these bacteria and you're saying those can't be bacteria because they're not dark they don't look like the, any of the other bacteria but these are mycoplasma it's actually mycoplasma hyorhinus and mycoplasma are unique they are some of the most stripped down or the most stripped down agents in the world and they have basically gotten rid of so much of their DNA um, that they no longer produce cell walls. These are cell wall-less bacteria. For that particular reason, they can, um, they commonly are causes of pneumonia. They require special antibiotics um, to kill them because antibiotics generally work against the peptidoglycans in the cell wall of bacteria that's how they're effective but those um, those antibiotics are useless against uh, mycoplasma so if you end up with a case of walking pneumonia you go to the doctor he's going to give you something called a z-pack or zithromycin which is very specific for how it acts against mycoplasma and these agents but once again they they want nothing more out of life than to be a psyllium. Um, when I was a resident, one of the first things I did with a resident, and it's always a bad idea to take a resident who's been there about a week or two with a bunch of grids and send them up to EM and say, we know that there's something in here, find it. And I was looking at a group of turtles um, from Fort Irwin, California, who had respiratory signs and, and a lot of mucus coming out of the nose and they said there's got to be a bacteria or a virus in there go find it and I was dumb and I said sure and so I spent probably 60 hours and just combing over and over these fields looking for a bacterium looking for a virus didn't see anything but I saw a lot of this stuff and I just thought those were mucus droplets and so I'd spent I could have spent an hour in there and come back with beautiful pictures of mycoplasma and someone finally rescued me and said you know that those are mycoplasma don't you and, I said, and I'm like oh god okay so that was mycoplasma agassizii and for uh, for my wonderful efforts on that project I got left off the paper and probably correctly because I wasted a whole lot of EM time Moving on from those that want to be psyllium, we have the spiral bacteria, and this is Helicobacter felis in the stomach of a dog, and there are a lot of Helicobacters out there. Almost every species has one or more. Helicobacters are commonly seen in the dog. They have a spiral appearance to them. They can be tr very tricky to stain on a silver stain or with osmium because it tends to glom onto them and make some sort of a line or a cylinder instead of this uh, nice uh, wavy spiral bacteria. Note at one end of the bacterium you have this structure here which is a flagellum and if we could get a little closer in here we would see the very characteristic 9 plus 2 arrangement of doublets and singlets. This characteristic of cilia you know, now we've seen it all the way from, from bacteria up to uh, very sophisticated uh, mammals like man who have cilia, and they're all made the same way.
This is a macrophage from a fish. This is a fathead minnow and doesn't make any difference what kind of fish it is. It was rife with granulomas and this macrophage is full of bacteria. And you can look at that and you can say, oh, I know what that is, that is. And then you realize, I got no idea because all bacteria look alike. This one, you have to know, is rife with, uh, uh, with granulomas throughout its body. Um, and the granulomas, when you put a phyfrocco on them, turn a bright red. This is uh, a mycobacterium, one of the uh, aviometricellulary forms. This picture was taken so long ago, they didn't have the ability. So they just called it all mycobacterium avium or microbacterium marinum. So bacteria, you just can't do too much with them. I like this picture. What kind of cell is it? Well, look at all the beautiful pseudopods. So this makes it a macrophage. You can see them wrapping around and starting to gobble up these bacteria. And if you, if you look at you can't tell what the bacteria are, obviously. This is an alveolar macrophage from an African green monkey that had been aerosolized with plague or Yersinia pestis. And you can't tell that from here. This material here is immunogold. And immunogold um, is prepared against a particular pathogen. So when you do ultrastructure, um, you can be sure that these, this is Yersinia pestis because they're coated with the immuno, immuno gold and not another random bacteria like a Bordetella or a Staph or a Strep or something like that. So it's, it's a technique um, that was used way back in the day, even before immunohistochemistry, for ensuring that you were looking at the proper pathogen. Okay, we're moving into another uh, area of bacteria where you can actually tell what you're looking at. And this is chlamydia. Uh, this is from a green tur sea turtle. It's the harvest sea turtle, and it really doesn't make any difference because you have no idea what you're looking at. But uh, chlamydia is a bacteria that has a, a very characteristic look. There are two distinct types in an intermediate form. And when we look at these down here that look a little like dense core granules, and more than once I've looked at, at a, a slide uh, in a testing situation, I'm like, is it a dense core granule? Is it chlamydia? Is it a dense core granule? Is it, is it chlamydia? Well, if all we had were these dense core granule-like elementary bodies, these are the resistant forms, they're resistant in nature, they're just, they haven't blossomed yet to become infectious, um, but that's all we had. Well, then I might think it's a, a dense core granule and I'm looking at some sort of chromaffin tumor. However, then we have these big forms here, which are the reticular bodies. And these are the pathogenic forms. These are the replicative forms. And this one even has an RB on it. But So you will see that these are replicative forms. Elementary body, reticular body, and then they have some that are just sort of in between that are their elementary bodies are just starting to blossom. These are the, wait for it, intermediate bodies, because they're intermediate between an elementary body and a reticulate body. And so this is what chlamydia looks like. And if you look at it under the microscope, what you see is in infected cells, you see these little purple dots in the cytoplasm. And they real correspond very nicely to these forms of the bacteria. So uh, chlamydia, Cytosci, thankfully, they stopped with all the other Chlamydophila names and everything now is Chlamydia Cytosci. And just another picture. This is in the intestine of a pig. This, I believe, actually went on to maybe a, uh, something like this was on a certification exam uh, in a galaxy far, far away. And we're looking at these vacuoles in the apical cytoplasm of enterocytes or in the center of some of these enterocytes. And, and when you look close, um, there's a nice inset so you can see the elementary body, the reticular body, the intermediate body, and you can pick them up. This is mostly reticulate, maybe one intermediate. These are mostly elementary bodies. So this is what chlamydia looks like. And this is one you should be able to pick out of a lineup. Another large bacterium whose wall is not very prominent is, is rickettsia or neorickettsia. This is a case of, of 
Potomac horse fever. Um, now it is Neorakezia uh, rustichii. Used to be Rustichia rustichia, or it's actually now, sorry, it's been named Ehrlichia rustichii. It used to be Neorakezia rustichii. And when it first came out, they said it's a trilaminar bacteria. It's got a weird cell wall. And no, that's not true. These are large bacteria, and they're encased within phagosomes. And uh, so this la two of the three of the trilaminar membrane that this was reputed to have was actually the two membranes of the host phagolysosome. Just to remind you, not much you can tell. Thin cell wall, um, not very dense, oblong. This is, this is actually E. coli, so this is your, your gram-negative cells. I said one other thing that you could actually see within a bacteria. I can make nothing out of that or that or that. But the spore forming bacteria, this one being Bacillus anthracis, you can see the spore. These are robust uh, bacilli with spore, so they go into um, a, a particular uh, subset of gram positive bacteria that makes spores. And I just like this picture. There's nothing special. This is a neutrophil who is smoking a cigar, or actually this is uh, anthrax bacillus. But I thought that was a fun way that we can end this particular lecture. It's been over an hour. I appreciate you uh, hanging in there. As always, at the end of this lecture, I wish you good health, great happiness, and a wonderful life. And I hope to see you again at the next lecture where we're gonna finish infectious agents, we're gonna cover protozoans, we'll cover fungal agents, and we're gonna cover neoplasms. So I'll see you then.